Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Yannick Verbele from uh, Brussels University. Uh, I'm a researcher uh, finishing uh, a PhD in energy harvesting and renewable energy for electronic systems uh, later this year. Um, you may wonder why I'm giving this talk on a, uh, a conference like this one. Well, obviously, there is a lot of potential in new renewable energy. You all know renewable energy from large-scale applications, but there is also a huge potential for uh, small uh, applications like electronics. And I'm going to try to motivate you to look into this technology in uh, the next hour. So if you just look around you, you all have this kind of wireless devices. Uh, some of you are wearing one. Yeah, the badge of the camp is one of them. Uh, and they're currently powered by batteries, obviously. Uh, so batteries are historically a very interesting solution because a modern battery um, mimics the properties of an ideal power supply uh, quite well. So that means that the voltage remains stable uh, until the battery is nearly empty and then it falls off really quickly. So that means that you have a nearly perfect voltage source which is very convenient for electronic systems. But batteries have a lot of drawbacks, uh, which we'll uh, get into later. So the question is now, if we all have these devices, are there alternatives? And obviously, the alternative is renewable energy. So if you think about the Netherlands, what do you think about first? Windmills, windmills of course, yes, windmills. So windmills are the, the primary energy harvesting method already for a um, long, long time. Um, and they are pretty renewable. Uh, wind is being produced by uh, the sun indirectly. So if you harvest wind, you're indirectly harvesting sunlight. So it's very um, convenient since there are a lot of areas around the world where there is a lot of wind. There are also, unfortunately, more areas where there is no wind. So it's not a solution for everywhere. But you could use this uh, already since ancient times. If you think about the Netherlands, what else do you think about? Water and bicycles, bicycles and windmills. Yeah. And bicycles are also a very convenient uh, type of uh, renewable energy because they have these uh, generators on the bicycle. If you drive the bicycle, you attach the, the generator, then you basically convert some of your uh, physical uh, power into uh, electrical power. And then there's also still uh, the food in the Netherlands, which I, as a Belgian, don't consider suitable for human consumption. So that's <laughs> biomass. Uh, which is also a form of renewable energy, if you think about it, right? Um, so why not batteries, uh, you could ask? Well, the badge does have a battery, so what's, what's so bad with batteries? Well, first of all, uh, batteries um, have a, a limited lifetime. Yeah. They run empty after a while. Uh, if they're a primary cells, which means non-rechargeable, uh, then they have a limited lifetime. You can calculate this out. Uh, but they can start leaking, for example. Uh, if you have a, a large, uh, a long lifetime device, then you open it up after five uh, more years, then you may have noticed that the battery starts leaking. And it leaks its electrolytes into your device, which corrodes the PCB, and everything is ruined. Uh, rechargeable batteries don't have this problem that they run out eventually. By the way, you could also recharge a non-rechargeable battery exactly once. That's a hack. Uh, but even rechargeable batteries uh, have only a limited uh, number of charge discharge cycles. Uh, for uh, a cell phone or a, a laptop battery, uh, these types of cells are commonly used. Uh, lithium ion, lithium polymer batteries, 18650 form factor. You can recharge them around uh, between 200 and 600 times. And then their capacity drops uh, below 80% of their original capacity. And that's the point where people start wondering, why is my cell phone battery uh, not lasting the entire uh, day anymore? So we have this amazing technology uh, where you're um, having a wireless device. Uh, we have all the infrastructure in place. We have powerful processors. We have very uh, neat screens with high resolution. We have high-speed internet connections. You can stream porn on your way to work in the morning, but probably you won't be able to stream porn again in the evening because your battery will have run empty during the day. Which is really a shame, yes, I totally agree about that. So, batteries have a uh, limited capacity. Uh, but they also create um, a lot of environmental problems. Uh, first of all, uh, the natural resources that are required to make these batteries are often um, 
dug up from the earth in uh, countries where we don't really know that uh, the environmental problems exist. Usually because it's either large corporations which uh, control the entire mining operation or the local governments have such um, stakes uh, in this operation that everything is being controlled. So you see here uh, a mining operation uh, in Brazil. Uh, these are the, uh, the rare earth metals typically being used uh, in batteries. Think about cobalt, for example. Uh, this is the scale of uh, the village there in the, in the lower uh, right corner. That gives you an idea of the scale of the pollution that is going on. Yeah. Uh, you may have um, known from ancient times already that to extract gold uh, from ore, uh, toxic metals like uh, mercury are being used to create amalgams that can be used to extract gold from uh, the ore surrounding it. But the concentrations are ever decreasing. So the, the rich ore deposits are now close to being depleted, which means that uh, more ore needs to be extracted from the earth to uh, harvest the same amount of uh, metals. So you need ever increasing um, huge amounts of natural resources being dug up to extract ever decreasing amounts of natural resources. And that's a problem because you have waste being produced uh, during the manufacturing of batteries, but you also have waste being produced when they are being recycled. And that's also a huge problem. Um, for example, Belgium has uh, one of the, the world leader rankings in uh, recycling batteries. And world leader ranking means that around uh, 65 to 70 percent of batteries is actually being collected and recycled. That seems quite a lot, but it also means that 30 percent of batteries still end up in landfills. And in many parts of the world, the ratings are much, much worse than that. So that means that the efforts required to dig up these minerals from the earth and convert them into batteries are actually going to waste because these same minerals are uh, not being uh, recycled properly. And at this moment already, it is more profitable uh, to mine uh, from a waste dump than to actually uh, mine from uh, a quarry. Because the concentration of raw metals is higher uh, in a garbage dump than it is in uh, most quarries around the world, which is uh, quite bad if you think about it. So what is the solution then? Well, renewable energy. Um, we have uh, many different types of them. Well, we all know light, of course, uh, solar energy. It's all around us, solar panels. I'll get into this later. Very convenient light source um, because uh, the sun is nearly indepletable. Uh, but there's also thermal energy not always available uh, on the large scale, but definitely suitable for uh, energy harvesting purposes. Kinetic energy, we all know that from the wind turbines, but there are many other sources, like your bicycle, for example, is a, a nice uh, example of a kinetic uh, energy source. Uh, radiation is uh, upcoming, I'll dig into that as well. Um, and finally, uh, chemical energy. Yeah, there are uh, many organisms living in deep uh, uh, under ocean trenches that have never seen sunlight, just like most uh, engineers and nerds around us, um, and that only live on uh, chemical uh, energy, just like us. Uh, so energy harvesting, to put it in a scale, uh, there are many uh, different um, size categories. So you know energy harvesting from the megawatt uh, uh, installations. So these are commercial installations producing megawatt ranges. Uh, the ones on your roof go to a few kilowatts at most. Uh, but what we're really interested in for electronics is the sub-watt uh, range. Yeah. So if you can harvest a few uh, watts or microwatts or even nanowatts, they can already do a whole lot with modern technology. And that is where the interesting part starts because then the question comes, how do you scale uh, these existing technologies? So when uh, Nikola Tesla uh, invented uh, AC generators, that's already a long, long time ago, uh, then the technology didn't substantially change since that time. But in recent years, we want to shrink this technology down. We want to uh, make them portable. We want to uh, integrate them in wearable devices, in uh, a lot of portable, autonomous, smart systems. So making something on a megawatt scale is actually quite easy. The larger you make something, the more efficient it becomes, uh, the more um, easy it comes to, to construct. 
But if you scale it down to a watt range, for example, that's already a six order of magnitude difference, then it becomes slightly more complex to design something. You see this kind of yeah, bicycles in, in stations in Belgium, railway stations, where people sit on and then they start to pedal and then they can plug in uh, their cell phone or their, their laptop and then they get the impression that they're actually generating renewable energy. Yeah. Um, the question is, well, how do you scale the same technology uh, another six um, orders of magnitude down to the microwatt range? Is it possible to make a kinetic energy harvester that is small enough to fit into uh, the pockets of your pants, for example? Yeah, that is the question we're trying to answer in energy harvesting. So if you're thinking about energy harvesting, um, it's more like looking at the environment what is around you and which types of energy can we actually harvest electrical power from? That is the baseline. And there are a lot of different approaches. For example, assume that you're going hiking in the mountains. Uh, in summer, of course, you want to be able to have Twitter updates uh, about your progress uh, in the hiking. So uh, you need uh, a connection, of course. So you need a phone. Uh, to be able to make selfies uh, from the mountains because nobody has seen a mountain before. Uh, so obviously you need a solar cell on a backpack uh, to recharge your phone while you're hiking. Uh, this is actually, from a, an energetic point of view, a very interesting approach. Why? Because the sunlight that is otherwise falling on this backpack doesn't have any useful purpose. It just heats up the black backpack and this heat then just flows off uh, with the wind. You don't have energy from it. So by putting a solar cell on a backpack, you can actually have a net uh, gain in energy. Uh, this is some energy that would otherwise not be used in a useful way. On the other hand, if you're uh, using that same generator on a bicycle, then that's a whole different story. There's something like the law of conservation of energy, which means that energy cannot be destroyed nor created. So if you want to extract uh, mechanical energy from the system to convert it to electrical energy, it means that you will have to pedal harder. So it is still a form of energy harvesting, but you have to put more energy into it to convert a small fraction into electrical power. And always keep in mind that these energy harvesters, no matter if it's a solar cell or an electrical harvester for mechanical energy or a thermal harvester or an RF harvester, none of them have an efficiency even close to 100%. So that means that you have to put a lot more mechanical energy into the system to get a tiny fraction of electrical power out, right? Um, the completely ridiculous uh, type of energy harvesting also exists, that if you have uh, active beacons, let's use, for example, active RFID, you all know these scanners uh, at shops, there are many easy ways to bypass these, by the way, aluminum foil. I won't dig into this, this is out of scope of the talk. Uh, but these basically transmit uh, an active field. And the same rule applies there. The efficiency of such an RF harvester is between the 2 and the 5%. So that means that for each watt of uh, energy you want to get out in your wireless system, you have to put in 20 watts of electrical power. Quite a low efficiency. So the right side is to be avoided. The left side is to be preferred. Now, there are a lot of uh, applications already existing. What I'm now telling is not anything new. Uh, if you look around you, there are the, uh, many commercial available implementations. For example, environmental monitoring on the top left side. Uh, there's a lot of uh, interest in environmental monitoring. Uh, ambient air pollution, for example, is quite a hot topic. Uh, but also pollutants um, for uh, bees, for insects. Uh, these are a growing concern. If you're living in a city, then uh, you sacrifice two years of your life uh, just because of air pollution. So if you're getting 80 years old, then two years is quite a substantial uh, amount of your life that you're missing out on. So uh, there is a growing concern uh, among the population that, for example, air pollution is something that needs to be monitored and autonomous uh, solar-powered stations are ideal for that. So it's one of the applications that are at the moment uh, being developed. Uh, wearables are another uh, interesting approach. Um, so if you have sm uh, small wearable applications, externally or internally, uh, that is to be determined, then uh, you can harvest uh, electrical power from your body, uh, either through heat or through motion, a lot of uh, different possibilities. Um, vibration energy harvesting is also being used. For example, to prevent trains from colliding, 
uh, to uh, monitor uh, all kinds of um, industrial installations like uh, compressors, generators, uh, pumps, uh, systems that vibrate. Uh, there are um, very specifically designed um, uh, harvesters for this that vibrate uh, together with the system. Uh, if a compressor is close to you know, requiring maintenance, then the frequency of its vibration starts deviating because the bearings are wearing out, for example. Uh, and an energy harvester cannot only harvest energy from this, uh, from this uh, vibration source, but can also detect the vibration frequency. And it can do some smart processing on this, and the energy harvester can uh, send a text message to some uh, maintenance monkey and saying, hey, my bearings need to be replaced because otherwise next week I'll be failing. Uh, which is preventive maintenance, which can save a company a lot of money. So especially in industry, uh, people are interested in this kind of technology. Uh, public domain is interested in for um, the health monitoring. So there are a lot of uh, different stakeholders that could benefit from, from energy harvesting. Now, there are five factors that play an important role. And now I come to the, the, the essence of this talk. Why are we having it here? Well, quite frankly, because there are five factors that continuously improve technologically and make new uh, possibilities um, as they go. For example, uh, the harvesters themselves are uh, getting better each day. And if harvesters are getting better, that means that you get a better efficiency, or you could harvest from new power sources. It means that you could get uh, a much higher uh, input power to your system. Uh, sensors are also improving. There are a lot of new sensors available. Think about wearable sensors, for example. Uh, diabetes is a growing problem uh, in our society. So glucose uh, sensors are becoming a more and more hot topic. Uh, but these things are at the moment requiring a lot of power. So if you can make them low power through applying MEMS technology, for example, then there are many new applications possible. Uh, if we're going to uh, processing, uh, then uh, microcontrollers uh, are getting increasingly efficient. For example, your batch, uh, your, your uh, CAM batch, now has a dual core um, a microcontroller running at 180 megahertz uh, with lots of uh, memory, uh, RAM, flash memory on board. If I would have told you 10 years ago that uh, a wearable device would have uh, a dual core microcontroller running at uh, 180 megahertz, would I all have laughed at me, probably. And yeah, rightfully. Uh, this is just one way to illustrate how fast this technology is evolving. So each day there are new applications being made possible because each of these five pillars uh, are improving. Uh, storage and power conversion, I'll take them together in this talk, um, are also important factors. Uh, forget about batteries for the moment. Uh, there are new technologies, supercapacitors, solid state batteries uh, that uh, make new domains um, in, in energy storage and which may enable long-time uh, autonomy. And finally, actuators. Uh, I'm putting here an antenna. Uh, also goes a lot broader than that. Uh, some of you may have uh, attended the LoRa talk earlier today, uh, illustrating the possibilities of a long-range radio. You can now, with 15 milliwatts of power, uh, reach a, a distance of 15 kilometers in range, uh, which is huge compared to a few years ago. Uh, Bluetooth Low Energy is covering uh, the lower side of the spectrum with a, large, uh, a lot har um, larger data rate, but also uh, much higher power consumption. So whether you're going for a long range and high throughput or a, uh, a long range and um, a small throughput, there are different um, wireless uh, solutions possible, widely available in the market, commercially available. There are chips that it could readily available in, in your application. So, just to give you an idea of how fast this technology is progressing, this is a, an annual graph uh, of uh, solar energy harvesters, basically solar panels. Um, and you see, of course, that they are uh, steadily going up. So there are many different types of solar cells that are under active development. You know the silicon type solar cells because you see them on roofs, you see them uh, in all kinds of wearable products, but there are a lot of exotic types as well. So, Whenever you have a great idea, you implement it on a prototype, you go to Enroll, they put it under a one kilowatt uh, light bulb uh, at a distance of one meter and illuminating one square meter, and they're testing the efficiency. And then you see uh, that there are a lot of interesting things coming out. Uh, you all know uh, polycrystalline silicon cells, for example. Yeah. You can easily recognize them by holding them under an angle, and you see the different crystals. 
these are at the moment reaching an efficiency around 20 to 21 percent. So they're not too bad, uh, but they are really easy to manufacture. And easy is relative for a solar cell. Um, if you're going to the, the better uh, solar cells that we're talking about monocrystalline silicon cells, uh, these are matte, like these, so you don't see any crystals in them anymore. Uh, and these have a much higher efficiency. So this is the kind of cells that are being sent uh, to space in satellites and, and spaceships. You also occasionally see them uh, in, in consumer applications, but they're quite expensive. So difficult to manufacture because they need to be a single crystal, as the name suggests. Uh, amorphous silicon cells, um, you know them from calculators, for example, those are the red cells um, or the, the darker blue cells. Uh, they have a lower efficiency. Uh, but they are also much cheaper to produce. And uh, as a nice uh, add-on, yeah, you can make them flexible. Yeah. So if you're thinking about wearables, for example, then this kind of solar cells are really nice because they are watertight. Uh, so they are rain uh, resistant. Uh, and they just have two electrodes on the back, which you can directly solder on. So if you're thinking about hiking in the mountains, well, this is a, a nice cell with a, a board around it, so you can stitch it to your backpack uh, and hook it up to an energy harvester, for example. These cells are not commercial. Uh, these are not prototypes. These are actually commercially available uh, cells. You can buy them off eBay, off AliExpress, uh, and they only cost a few dollars per piece. Um, Something worth mentioning is um, a historical mistake uh, that are uh, cadmium tellurium uh, solar panels. Anybody have any idea why cadmium tellurium solar panels are not a good idea? Because they have cadmium in them, obviously, yes. So um, tellurium is a, a bottleneck. There are no tellurium mines in the world. You can look that up. So where's tellurium coming from? Well, it's actually collected as a, a side product uh, in zinc mining. Um, and for uh, around 40 years, nobody knew what to do with tellurium. Uh, so, for example, the Russians um, collected huge stockpiles of tellurium because they were interested in the zinc and they didn't know anything to do with the tellurium. So they put them in warehouses and then suddenly there was a guy who said, hmm, hey, I have a genius idea. What about making a really toxic type of solar cell that we can put this tellurium in? That sounds like a wonderful idea. Uh, so they combined two really toxic elements together combining them into cadmium tellurium uh, solar cells, and the result is that this stockpile of uh, tellurium ran out pretty quickly, obviously, uh, because you can't mine it. It's tied to the zinc uh, mining supply. So there are now a lot of cadmium tellurium solar panels on roofs, and they're not being maintained anymore because there is no tellurium enough to make commercially available uh, cadmium tellurium solar panels. Just to give you an idea of what not to do uh, on a long-term scale in energy harvesting. Uh, there are a lot of emerging technologies also available. Um, Multi-junction cells, for example, um, that's basically just stacking different types of solar cells on top of each other that harvest in different um, uh, frequency bands. Um, uh, CIGS cells, disensitized solar cells um, that are disensitized solar cells. Basically, what is a disensitized solar cell? Well, if you have a, a piece of glass, you coat it with a titanium dioxide and you pour beetroot juice over it then you have a disensitized solar cell. So it doesn't have to be extremely complex. Uh, the only thing that makes these slightly more difficult is because the, these are chemically stable over a long time. And that is uh, a recurring problem for most of uh, energy harvesters in the uh, experimental range. That is how to make them last for a long time. Most of them are really uh, poor at resisting UV light, so they decay after a long time. And obviously, the sun has a lot of uh, UV light. Uh, in its spectrum, so many of these cells will decay after a few years. Uh, that's why these cells are uh, commonly used uh, indoors, where there is no UV light from uh, uh, artificial light sources, but outdoor, these are still a problem. Uh, the good thing is that these uh, photosensitive dyes are everywhere. Uh, there are a lot of flowers that have them, there are a lot of uh, vegetables and, and red fruits that have them. Uh, perovskite is a, a mineral that can be found in quarries just uh, across the border um, with uh, Germany. In quarries, you can just dig it up and process it in a, a clean way into solar panels. So in contrast with the heavily polluting uh, silicon cell uh, solar industry, these uh, um, technologies uh, have a, a much better yield and are much more um, environmental friendly. So I think these are the emerging technologies to watch out for uh, in the next years. Um, we can also harvest vibrations. 
Uh, vibrations are in the sense of mechanical energy. As soon as something is vibrating, uh, then uh, you can convert these vibrations into electrical power. This is also not something new. Uh, those of you who are old enough to have known the, the, the era of watches, when, when we wore watches around our waists, um, these watches were initially uh, driven by a quartz crystal. Why is a quartz crystal interesting? Well, if you apply a voltage, then it vibrates at a very constant frequency. Yeah, everything works vice versa as well. So if you make it vibrate, it will produce a voltage. And quartz is not the only material uh, that does this uh, sugar also exhibit this uh, property, and, and bones as well. Uh, so if you break uh, your leg, then you will, for a fraction of a second, create uh, some, uh, some renewable energy. Unfortunately, breaking bones repeatedly is not a, a durable, um, sustainable way of energy harvesting, but it is possible. Yeah, so I, I want... Yes, well... There are some ethical restrictions to that. Of, of course, you, you can try, but yes, we, we should not go too deeply into that. Um, fortunately, you don't have to break all the bones of your body just for the sake of renewable energy. Uh, we have a lot of uh, synthetic materials as well. Uh, PZT is one of the oldest ones, uh, but PVDF is upcoming. It's a uh, polyvinyl defluoride, it's uh, a, um, a compound that can be easily spread out over any surface and as soon as you bend it, uh, there is a, a voltage uh, appearing over its terminals. Uh, so the advantage of this is that you can uh, bend it and rebend it and reshape it hundreds of thousands of times, so this creates harvesters with uh, a long lifetime. Uh, so how do you do this practically? Just to give you an idea, uh, you start coating a uh, cantilever um, shaped uh, base material, a substrate, with these PVDF films. Uh, you turn them into a disc, which can be pressed on, and then you make a nice cover for it, uh, and you have uh, a button. And that's really convenient, because if you press the button, you actually mechanically deform uh, this film, um, and you create uh, a pulse of uh, energy. So, when people press this button, they don't realize they are actually providing the power to power the system they are controlling with it. So you can directly harvest human power with a button. Unfortunately, uh, these kind of devices are very uh, frequency constrained, so they work really well if you're um, uh, um, uh, aiming them in their uh, resonance frequency, in their mechanical resonance frequency. Unfortunately, if you deviate from this resonance frequency, as you show in the graph, then the amount of power you can harvest drops very quickly. So the difficulty and the holy grail in energy harvesting vibrations is designing a broadband um, vibration energy harvester. Uh, if I have to walk around at a very constant speed to make this harvester work, people are going to think it's pretty retarded. However, if I can make this harvester work at any speed I'm walking at, then this is a very convenient way of powering uh, wireless devices. Of course, the trivial way of doing it uh, is just uh, using uh, electromagnetics. If you move uh, a magnet in and out of a copper coil, then it induces uh, a current. Uh, just already uh, old technology, but it's very, very difficult to make this technology small enough. And that is what a lot of companies are working on right now. For example, these wireless switches uh, that control uh, your ceiling lights or your shutters or your, the ceiling fan in the summer. How do we take this existing technology that's already well known, that is ancient, but how do we make it small enough to fit into portable devices to make it convenient enough to use in everyday applications? Uh, finally, covering um, heat harvesting. Uh, you all learned about uh, Peltier cells, probably in school. They look like this. Uh, they're basically semiconducting material pressed between two ceramic plates. Um, if you uh, apply a voltage, uh, to one side, then uh, one side becomes cold and the other becomes hot. Also works in the other direction. If you apply a thermal gradient over uh, this device, then it will create uh, an electrical voltage. Uh, this voltage is very small. It's typically in the order of microvolts per cell uh, per degree centigrade. But um, if you put a lot of them in series, then you can get a voltage out that is quite usable. So we now have uh, thermal harvesters. They uh, come in all kinds of shapes. These are also commercially available devices, for example. Uh, these are, for example, being used in uh, these USB fridges that we're all uh, 
engineer, so we need a constant supply of uh, cool drinks to keep us going. So you need such a small fridge next to your laptop where exactly one can of Coke fits in. Um, and these are used uh, to, to cool this can. Uh, so they can easily run from a USB port. You get them in uh, lots of different shapes. So you want um, a big can of Coke, yeah, then you can use the big ones. But it can be uh, scaled down arbitrarily small. So this is uh, also a heat harvester that easily fits uh, on a fingernail. So they don't have to be uh, very big, they don't have to be very small either. You can make them any arbitrary size you want for your application. Um, they, the nice thing about it is that they work both ways. So they can harvest from a heat source, but can also harvest from a cold source, as long as you can maintain this temperature difference. Um, they have a very high power density, but of course they heat up your cool object or they cool down your hot object. Uh, fortunately, there are um, interesting applications. Uh, for example, in um, industrial applications where you have steam pipes that are constantly at a, a very high elevated temperature, but also uh, mechanical uh, systems like compressors that heat up tremendously much. Uh, domestic environments, like uh, your heater at home, you need a thermostatic valve, can be controlled by a thermal energy harvester, and of course wearables. Yeah, the human body produces a, a constant output of around 200 watts of uh, thermal energy. Uh, that's, uh, that's quite a bit. Of course, you can't cover your entire body uh, in these uh, energy harvesters. Again, it's possible. It looks pretty silly if you're walking over the street like that. Uh, but, for example, uh, you could use your uh, mother-in-law in, in matrix style to harvest um, thermal energy from. So that's, that's perfectly possible. And then your mother-in-law also has a, a future use. Um, Again, again, I'm not obliging you to do this, are just suggestions, just for clarity. Um, sensors, very important. That's uh, one of the, the, the other pillars. Uh, sensors are very uh, interesting devices because they can sense the uh, environment around us. But to have a, a performance, you need to power them with a, a constant current or a constant voltage. And keeping them powered is uh, often a very complex matter. For many sensing applications, uh, the sensor needs to be uh, turned on for a specific period of time. For example, if you want to uh, measure air pollution, uh, then you need to uh, run the sensor for around 5 to 10 seconds before you can get a reading out. So it means you can't run them at a the very small duty cycle. And it means that you have a tremendous amount of power going into these things. Uh, MEMS technology, microelectromechanical systems, uh, offer a nice opportunity here because they shrink down uh, the sensor make them uh, mechanically smaller, but also reduces the power consumption. You can use them for both sensing applications and for harvesters. So there are now um, vibration harvesters, for example, that are also made with uh, MEMS technology, and these will also uh, emerge in the market in the next years. So um, let's look at a real-world um, environment and, and see how we can apply energy harvesting in this application. So if you look around you, um, it's pretty cold here. It's pretty dark. Uh, so the um, types of energy you could harvest are pretty limited. So there is some artificial lighting. Uh, there is uh, a lot of structures that are now cooling down from being heated up during the day. So you have temperature gradients. You have light. There is also a lot of radiation available because we all need Wi-Fi to stream that porn, as I explained er earlier. So. Um, there are many different uh, energy sources, but you have to quantize them. You have to know how much is available, when is it available, uh, and how can I harvest from them? What is the energy density? Uh, so to do this, uh, you need to do some benchmarking. Uh, and that is the part that is often overlooked. Um, if many people are um, designing such an application, for example, uh, in an industrial environment, um, people are uh, being commissioned uh, in electronic engineering, to uh, retrofit an existing application with energy harvesters, and then the boss says, here, we have already this product, there are thousands of them on the market, uh, but the uh, batteries and are leaking, et cetera, et cetera. Please uh, turn this into an energy harvesting application. Yeah, okay, it's something more complex than just throwing a battery out and putting a solar cell on. 
So it is a quite complex matter to model an environment and then estimate how much power is available and then dimension the size of your harvester accordingly. So what you see in commercial applications is that either harvesters are not used in uncritical applications, like all these uh, solar-powered garden lights, for example, um, or the uh, energy harvesters are overdimensioned in just to be sure they're big enough. Unfortunately, as I explained earlier, if you overdimension the harvester, it means you need to harvest and mine a lot more raw resources to construct these harvesters. They're also getting a lot more expensive and they're physically getting bigger. So it's very beneficial to know exactly how much power and energy is available to dimension a harvester optimally. So to do that, uh, we designed uh, these boards. Uh, they are equipped with a lot of sensors um, to do some benchmarking. A few interesting ones, I won't go over all of them, uh, but they have uh, a broadband light sensor, for example, uh, that allows to measure all kinds of uh, lights, uh, both in the UV spectrum, in the visible light spectrum, in the infrared spectrum. Uh, there are temperature sensors uh, to measure temperature differences. There are even pressure sensors to measure the ambient uh, surroundings. We have particle sensors to give uh, an idea of uh, the air quality, to get uh, an airflow ID. Um, and a lot of other uh, hardware, which I won't discuss in detail, uh, which you can uh, come talk to me about after uh, the discussion. Um, of course, this is uh, just a, a first version. So we developed it later on in uh, a project called the uh, Ambient Energy Monitor. Uh, ambient, uh, the Ambient Energy Monitor has a uh, goal to provide electronic uh, engineers an easy interface on quantizing the amount of uh, ambient power available in a certain environment. So there are, at the moment, uh, three of these uh, uh, modules finished, one for vibrations, one for thermal energy, uh, and one for light. And a fourth one for RF energy is still uh, upcoming. So how do they look? Well, like this. That's one of the, the current prototypes. So they have a microcontroller on them, uh, equipped with a lot of sensors. Um, this is the version for uh, vibrations. Uh, it gives uh, you an idea of any vibration that happens in the immediate environment of the device. It has accelerometers, it has gyroscopes on board, it has shock sensors, it has tilt sensors, it even has uh, a PVDF transducer on board to capture any kinds of uh, airborne sound waves, which you could also harvest uh, energy from. So what this thing does is eventually spitting out um, uh, a file uh, with uh, samples for each type of uh, environmental data. Uh, and these can then be processed uh, in a way that allows to extract uh, profiles from this. So it tells you how much uh, of a certain type of environmental energy is available at any given time. What can you do with that? Well, you can use it to correlate with existing uh, energy harvesters. For example, each of these solar cells um, have uh, a different um, spectral characteristic. Some work better outside, some work better inside. If you look at your calculator, uh, then you will notice that most of these use these red cells. These are amorphous silicon cells. Why? Because amorphous silicon has a better uh, characteristic for, for example, cold fluorescent lights. Uh, while uh, polycrystalline and monocrystalline silicon cells uh, perform better outside. So assume you want to uh, construct something in the hallway of uh, your building, and the building has uh, a really small uh, external uh, um, window, for example, uh, but LED lighting. Then the question is, well, which type of solar cell is the best suitable uh, in this corridor? Uh, this is the way to do this. So you have the profiles of each type of uh, energy harvester. You measure uh, the spectrum that is available in this environment, and you just correlate them together to select the most optimal type of solar cell. So that not only gives you an idea of which type of solar cell is the most optimal, but it also gives you uh, an idea of price already, of availability. Um, to make your system working is basically just matching the energy balance. As I said before, you can't generate energy out of thin air, you can't destroy it either, so there is a balance that needs to be kept. You need to produce as much energy as you consume. If you have a large microcontroller running, uh, a touch screen interface, then you will have to harvest a considerable amount of power as well. Uh, so the ambient energy benchmark gives you an idea of how much energy is available. Um, you put in a flowchart and you dim dimension the harvester appropriately. 
On the other side, of course, you have your application. You have to measure it. Um, just check how much power it consumes over time. You can average it out if you have local energy storage. And this balance needs to be uh, matched. Um, there are already a few of these uh, interesting applications available. You all know these, for example, a nuisance um, next to the road. Um, these are uh, radar systems uh, often powered by uh, solar panels on top of them. Uh, and these are actually very uh, nice examples of proper pattern matching. When are most cars driving? Well, during the day, because most people are not engineers and they live during the day, uh, apparently. Uh, so that means that uh, your system will also need to be operated uh, most of the time during the day. So when is your solar cell producing the most power? Obviously, when the sun is shining. So when you match these two together, uh, then you see that you have a peak uh, in solar output uh, at noon, when the sun is in zenith and produces the most of power. Uh, for traffic, you have two peaks. You have uh, the uh, morning uh, rush hour and the evening rush hour. Uh, during uh, noon, uh, everybody is either at work or at school, uh, and then you have a dip again. But overall, you see that these are uh, pretty uh, well matched. And this is basically your ideal situation. If you can do this, then you can minimize the local energy storage that is required. And that means that you can scale down on a battery, for example. Uh, there are also new uh, possibilities uh, becoming uh, possible. For example, uh, supercapacitors, electric double layer capacitors. Uh, they are now growing uh, in capacity. When most of you were at school, uh, the teacher will have said, well, a capacitor goes up to a few a uh, dozen uh, uh, microfarads or a few thousand microfarads and you already have a big one. Well, at this moment we have uh, supercapacitors, electric double layer capacitors with a capacitance of uh, up to 1,600 farads uh, and they are as big as um, uh, this wireless presenter. Uh, as tall and maybe uh, a bit bigger in diameter, but not much bigger. So that means it can put a lot of uh, energy into these uh, supercapacitors. And supercapacitors don't have this problem that they start leaking. They don't have this problem that they wear out after a certain number of charge start cycles. So matching the patterns is actually quite beneficial for your system design. It's already being used in Mars rovers, for example, as well. Um, these also need to be able to um, communicate 24-7. So during the day, you can harvest uh, from the sun. Uh, at night, there is a, a very large temperature gradient on Mars because it doesn't have a proper atmosphere. So it means that uh, it, your rover heats up during the day, cools down at night. You have a temperature gradient, which you can harvest energy from. So this is called complementary balanced energy harvesting. You have a, a requirement, you have a budget, and you try to match the power requirements of your electronics with the supply uh, of your energy harvesters. So it can be a single energy harvester or it can be multiple energy harvesters working together to generate the required power. That is then the compl complementary balanced uh, aspect of the thing. Um, another example are, for example, roller coasters. And we all love them uh, when we get out. Um, there are trains running over the tracks. Uh, these are very interesting properties because the track vibrates quite heavily. So if you mount such a vibration energy harvester on the track, uh, then it vibrates when a train is passing by, and that's what you're interested in because you want to know where the trains are. So the moment that the train is passing by, your energy harvester is uh, producing a, a power output, and that is the moment when you want to make a wireless uh, transaction. Then you want to send uh, a status update uh, to the control center saying, OK, uh, I'm here on this track. I'm sensor uh, 432, and I am detecting a train passing by. And uh, if you dimension it correctly, then uh, your wireless transaction will be completed by the time the train is gone. Of course, you also need a, a standby uh, a control so that your system can actually uh, give a, a live pulse because otherwise you don't know if the train is actually there or just not being detected because the sensor failed. So you need a, a, a standby power, uh, and that could be a solar cell, for example. So by combining a small solar cell with a, a vibration energy harvester, you could get a, a much more performant system because you could eliminate the necessity for local storage altogether. And if you don't have this local storage, you could design a system that runs entirely on energy harvesting, on renewable energy, and doesn't have a battery. If it doesn't have a battery, it basically doesn't need maintenance because all these energy harvesters are solid state devices. 
So if you design them properly, they last a very long lifetime, and you can basically install these sensors on the track, and you never have to look at them anymore. That's, of course, a hypothetical situation. If you're clever, you will still check them regularly, but there are a lot of situations, for example, uh, in industrial environments, in a, a nuclear reactor, where it's physically impossible to do maintenance or very expensive to do maintenance, and then this kind of application becomes very profitable. Uh, the power path is something to keep in mind. Uh, you can't directly connect an energy harvester to an electronic system. Yeah. Hooking it up is not a great idea. Why? Because, for example, the output voltage of many harvesters will greatly vary. Uh, and this may damage uh, your electronics if you're over-volting them. Uh, so basically, you will always put a, a voltage regulator between them. Linear voltage regulators have very low efficiency. So if you're clever, you're using a DC-DC converter. There are now many uh, DC-DC converters specifically designed for energy harvesting applications with very high efficiency and very low quiescent current. Uh, after which, you have the choice where to put that energy. So you can either put it in a capacitor, uh, a supercapacitor, they look like this. So small cylinders, just like other ordinary capacitors. You could use it directly if your system is complementary balanced matched, or you can store them in solid state uh, batteries. Solid state batteries also exist already for a while. This is a development module from Simbet, uh, and the batteries actually are just chips. They are uh, batteries on a die, literally, and are also manufactured with a conventional semiconductor uh, process. Unfortunately, the capacitance is quite small. We're talking in milliamp hours here, a few milliamp hours, usually less than that. So the capacity uh, is very small, but these uh, cells have actually a duty cycle of over 100,000 charge discharge cycles. So if you compare that to the classic uh, lithium ion, lithium polymer cells, which rarely go over 1,000 cycles, then you may see the benefits of this kind of technology. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to make them stable. Uh, Thin Energy was um, a startup a few years ago. They attempted it. Uh, they made cells like these, uh, very thin, uh, therefore the name. Uh, we're talking about uh, less than half a millimeter in thickness here, uh, capacities up to a few milliamp hours but they vanished from the market, just because it's not profitable enough. And that's immediately also the bottleneck of energy harvesting, and I'll have to uh, crush your expectations on that. Energy harvesting is, for most applications, not more economical than classic batteries. And the inconvenient truth is that batteries are ridiculously cheap. If you uh, buy batteries in bulk, in China, for example, where they're being manufactured, then you're, you're talking about cents per battery. And an energy harvester or uh, a solid state cell could never uh, get this low within a few years. So it is sadly still a truth that uh, a classic battery is such a cheap and easy uh, solution that many manufacturers don't even consider energy harvesting. Um, luckily, there are a few guys who did see the light. Uh, An ocean is one of them. Uh, they already have commercial. Um, energy harvesting applications available on the market, wireless switches, for example, uh, they're already for sale, they're interfacing with their own wireless network, so you can just uh, buy a kit from them online, you mount their uh, wireless sensors um, on your ceiling, wherever you want, you mount a wireless switch uh, against your wall, you press the switch, it generates the power from the pressing event, and you never have to uh, worry about uh, changing batteries. Unfortunately, it's still quite expensive, uh, and that's why they still have to take off. Uh, but they are now working together with a lot of manufacturers. Uh, Nextream is uh, a manufacturer commercially manufacturing these kind of Peltier devices for industrial applications, for example. Uh, MyD is uh, manufacturing vibration energy harvesters. I think everybody knows what first solar will uh, manufacture for a type of solar cells. Uh, but the efficiency becomes uh, a huge issue. Uh, consider that a lot of these devices have a very low efficiency, and we shouldn't joke around about that. Uh, solar cells reach up to 45 to 48% for multi-junction cells, but in real-world application, it's much lower than that. If I look at these polycrystalline cells, I'm talking about 20 to 21% efficiency, so it means that only a fifth of the solar power that falls on them is actually being converted into electrical energy. But you can't do anything with that directly. You need to first um, 
have a DC-DC converter stage to stay in the maximum power point of these solar cells. And such a DC-DC converter also has an efficiency well below 100%. If you have to store this energy into a battery as a temporary storage, yeah, charging uh, a battery has its losses. You all know this, if you plug in your uh, smartphone to charge it, it will heat up. What is heating up? That is the battery that is uh, having a, a very low efficiency. So whether you're storing it in a battery or in a supercapacitor, you're basically wasting energy. If you're retrieving this energy, then you're losing again, because you always have losses over the internal resistance of your battery or your supercapacitor. And these batteries and supercapacitors never match the voltage of your system, so you need a second DC-DC converter stage, which again loses a lot of power. So if you look at the end-to-end -end efficiency from your 100% solar power or um, heat or, or vibrations, you only have a, a very tiny amount left. And to give you an idea of common efficiencies for solar cells, we already talked about it, uh, between 20 and 25 percent for crystalline uh, silicon cells. Uh, thermal energy harvesters, there the efficiency is even lower. We're talking about 7 to 8 percent uh, electrical efficiency. Vibration harvesters are even lower. There we're talking 4 to 6 percent. And RF energy harvesters, I'm not even talking about because it's embarrassingly low. Uh, there we're talking 1 to 2 percent electrical efficiency. So if you're now thinking about finding the holy grail and setting up a, a radiation uh, energy harvester next to your telco's um, uh, wireless power tower, uh, well, then they're going to uh, get at your door pretty quickly because for each watt you get out, they have to put in 100 watts uh, of uh, wireless transmission power. Uh, so that is uh, quite inefficient. Uh, the harvester coverage is also quite limited. Uh, this is a common RFID tag. People ask, well, are there any limitations on the amount of energy I can harvest? Well, the answer is no, if you could make your harvester uh, infinitely large. But in practical applications, the size of your harvester is limited, obviously. What well, is the size of this harvester? Well, this is the harvester coverage. It only captures energy in the flux that is it's covering, and it is pretty small. So do you want more power? Well, then either you have to increase the power source density or you have to make your harvester physically bigger. That are the two options. Uh, there is no such thing as making a tiny harvester that outputs watts or, or hundreds of watts of power. That doesn't exist and won't be existing anytime soon. So why do you want durability? Why do we want energy harvesting? Then you may wonder. Well, because you do not want to be the guy who has to climb up to that chimney to replace the batteries every two years. Believe me, you don't want to be that guy. So if you install something on that chimney, uh, then it better works reliably. And then it's your job uh, to design something that needs as little maintenance as possible. And it's usually um, leased material uh, where you're being a contract ma uh, maintainer. You have to climb up the tower. It costs you a lot of uh, money just on manpower. Uh, but also on insurance, for example, because these are dangerous working conditions. So if you can make this reliable just by design, by only using uh, off-the-shelf but uh, commercially validated components, by using solid-state components, then the autonomy will increase and you won't have any problems with uh, reliability. Uh, storage, a uh, small thing about it, already discussed the secondary chemical cells. Uh, these are the ones used on the batch, you already know them. Uh, they have uh, very interesting properties. They are lithium uh, polymer batteries. So you stick a knife in them and they burst into flames. Um, don't do that while you're wearing the badge, by the way. Um, electrolytic double air capacitors um, don't have this problem, uh, but they have a very high short circuit current. So if you want to um, uh, look uh, at the internals, it's basically just a capacitor with a modified electrolyte. Uh, very high uh, short circuit current, but doesn't have uh, this environmental hazard because it's just basically the same technology. Uh, the uh, solid state cells, uh, as uh, manufactured by Simbad, they use a classic uh, semiconductor technology, so are more polluting and lower um, capacity, so they're not really being used in any commercial product that I am aware about. If I'm mistaken, you know of any, please feel free to uh, join in the discussion afterwards. Uh, DC-DC converters, I 
think many of you will be familiar with the concept, so I won't elaborate too far on this. Um, there are two types. You have the buck converters, which decrease the voltage. You have boost converters, which increase the voltage. The interesting thing is that you can use them as charge pumps, so you could uh, control the rate at which power is being extracted from a harvester to uh, design a maximum power point tracker. Uh, if you have a, a solar cell, then it outputs its maximum power in one single point, uh, and that is the largest area under the curve. Uh, you want to operate the solar harvester in that point. And it's why you have these converter devices that are being sold for uh, hundreds of euros usually. Well, what they do is exactly operating the solar panels on your roof in that maximum power point. Uh, you also have these for energy harvesters. They're a lot smaller. Uh, linear technology is one of the companies that manufactures them, but uh, Texas Instruments, analog devices, microchip are also manufacturing them. The interesting part about it is that uh, they are now highly integrated. So many of you know these uh, cheap uh, Chinese bug boost converters. They come with a chip and an inductor and a few capacitors. Well, uh, many manufacturers now have integrated all these components. It's possible to create um, inductors uh, with a, a standard uh, silicon manufacturing process. So we're talking about a planner inductor on the chip itself. You don't need uh, an external inductor anymore. They're operating at frequencies between 2 and 10 megahertz switching speed. So the ripple is low and the footprint gets really, really small. So that means that you get a really high power density uh, and quite a good efficiency uh, for the price being. Um, I have to warn for MITs. Uh, who of you have heard about solar frigging roadways? Yeah, most of you. Uh, so this was uh, actually a Kickstarter uh, a few years ago. Um, just for those wondering, the moose is actually photoshopped in, uh, if you were wondering about that. Uh, so this was uh, uh, two uh, Americans who thought they had a genius idea. Uh, what if we could um, um, uh, coat all the roads in Alaska with solar panels? Then we could harvest energy from them, and then in winter we could uh, uh, melt the snow and the ice using uh, the power that is being produced by the solar panels. Now, nobody apparently considered the problem that there is no power being produced if there is snow on the solar panels. Uh, nonetheless, people didn't seem to realize that, and the campaign uh, gained over $2.5 million uh, in, in crowdfunding alone. Uh, while it has been proven uh, by J uh, Dave Jones and others in the meanwhile, that's just not uh, feasible. So if you just made a calculation, it doesn't add up. Um, it's uh, practically very difficult to make something that is uh, resistant against all kinds of uh, external damage. So a solar panel uh, belongs on a roof or somewhere aimed towards the sun. It doesn't uh, belong on a road. Uh, but still, there are a lot of people who uh, see uh, miracle solutions and kind of things and then throw their money at it. Well, if any of these people are in the room, please throw your money at me. I highly appreciate it. Um, but many of these things just will never work. And that's also why people are losing faith in all these crowdfunding uh, campaigns, because many of these things are already flawed uh, from the beginning. Um, there are a lot of opportunities, though. Uh, retrofitting is one of them. Um, if you're ha having existing applications that are running on batteries and you're tired of your smoke detector starting to beep in the middle of the fucking night because its batteries are empty, well, then energy harvesters are obviously the, the most interesting way to go. Uh, if you want to install systems uh, in a building for uh, CO2 monitoring, for smoke detection, uh, for humidity control, and just want to install them, and you only want to look at them when the building needs maintenance in another 25 years, then basically energy harvesters are the only solution. Uh, there are now government regulations um, and demands where, uh, for smart metering applications, so smart uh, uh, water meters, smart electricity meters, smart gas meters, that these meters need to have an autonomy of at least 16 years. So that means that the company needs to be able to install these meters into your basement. You need to be able to pile boxes on top of it and forget about it for the next 16 years. That's really, really hard to do with conventional batteries. So also in these applications, energy harvesters are gaining an increasing importance. Uh, now, development cycle is always the same. It's trial and error, as most of things in engineering. Uh, so you start with a prototype. You throw some math at it. That are the models that I discussed before. Uh, you test if it works, and if it doesn't, you um, 
uh, adapt the models uh, on the real uh, harvester and power budgets you have. So there are already uh, a lot of applications available, uh, weighting scales uh, with uh, solar harvesters, uh, body heat sensors, wearables. Um, they are still expensive, but they are there. Uh, then finally, state awareness. That's one of the, the remaining holy grails in energy harvesting. So your system needs to know what state it is in. Uh, for example, what is the time? Uh, if you want to uh, correlate data, then that's very important. Uh, but you also need to know the state of charge. So if I have a supercapacitor on board, or a rechargeable battery, or a state battery, uh, then how much um, energy is still available there? Uh, the batch does this by simply measuring the battery voltage um, with uh, one of the analog pins of the ESP32 uh, and converting this with a lot of math and a lot of models into a charge between 0 and 100%. You can do this for all kinds of uh, energy storage devices, but for some it's more complex uh, than for others. And uh, finally, the state of health. Um, why is this important? Well, because if you're talking about long um, autonomy systems, uh, 10, 15, 25 years, then of course these systems start deviating. Um, batteries uh, start to behave differently, they lose capacity, but also sensors start to decay. Uh, they need recalibration. So you need to uh, start tracking the health of your own system, do periodic recalibrations, keep track of how much energy can be stored, because otherwise you're running into trouble there. So the basic principle of these long autonomy smart systems is more complex than what you know from the, the classic topologies. Because there are a lot more problems in, for example, these long-time health monitorings. Uh, two concrete, very simple applications to round up the talk and to illustrate this for you. Um, here are these mountains again, which some of you may have seen already. Um, if you're going to a mountain, you're going skiing, then you want to know how much snow is there, of course, because it's pretty pointless to go to a mountain to go skiing if there is no snow. Uh, so what you do is build uh, a snow logger, uh, and you stick it on a pole. You know these uh, HC04S um, ultrasonic uh, distance sensors. You put them on a pole. You put a solar cell on top of it. The sensor aims down. It measures the distance. And then you know uh, what the snow height is. Um, you can transmit them to a base station using LoRa, for example. LoRa has a range up to 15 kilometers in line of sight. That's a really neat application. Uh, this is a very interesting application from an energy harvesting perspective. Why? Because it's really surprisingly easy to do. Uh, you have a low sample frequency, because except when there is an avalanche, the snow height usually doesn't change that fast. So you could get away with sampling each quarter of an hour, or half an hour, or even each hour. You could have local storage, not a problem at all. You could log this data and then uh, transmit it uh, into a block, for example. Um, and there are low reliability demands, uh, except uh, at one tourist or one skier that wouldn't come if there is no data available. Nobody's going to die um, if uh, there is one of these sensors failing. Okay, then it's maybe one slope that doesn't have uh, the snow height on it, but nobody's really going to give a, a shit about it. On the other hand, um, I'm from Belgium, uh, and our nuclear reactors are as um, stable as the mental state of our politicians, uh, which is not a lot, believe me. Uh, so we have a, a constant threat of a nuclear catastrophe. Uh, and this is a, another uh, scale of uh, energy harvesting constraints, of course. Uh, because if you want to put a harvester-powered uh, uh, detector around these uh, dangerous power stations uh, to detect a leak, then uh, obviously you want to know about that leak as fast as possible. So you need to do some continuous sampling. Um, and, and sample as fast as possible, because you want to be the first one to pick up. Uh, you want to have a continuous wireless communication with the base station, not only to transmit uh, this data, but also to send this keep a live pulse. Um, and you need uh, high uh, reliability, of course, because you don't want any of these sensors failing. If such an event occurs and you don't notice it, then you will have a zombie apocalypse on your hands before you even realize it. So it's really important uh, to take measures as fast as possible if such a, a leak is being detected. So it gives a, a really nice contrast. Um, one um, is quite simple to implement. The other is quite high demanding to implement. Although they're both outdoor applications, you can both use solar cells, but depending on the system, the requirements are completely different. 
Now, for those of you who are wondering, neither of these are actually existing at this moment. So uh, if you have the time, you could build them and you could get rich with them because these are nice opportunities. So to round up, before we go to Q&A, what is energy harvesting? Well, basically, I think it is a really nice opportunity to equip existing electronic applications with renewable energy. Uh, it's already available all around us. You look around, there is light, there is heat, there is uh, electromagnetic radiation. It's just there waiting for you to use uh, to power your own system. Uh, it's scalable, it's uh, reliable, uh, if you design it properly, and it could potentially, and I say potentially, lower the environmental cost of your system as well. If you do proper recycling from solar panels, for example, then you get the potential to really decrease the environmental cost. I really would like to thank you for staying up this late with me. Uh, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. If you have anything to add to the discussion, please feel free to do so. And if you're too tired, then I wish you a very good night, and I hope you found it interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Please, sir. Um, yes, it is. So this is what we're currently working on. Okay, uh, so the question is, how could we uh, basically adapt the behavior of um, wireless systems uh, to incorporate uh, the, the um, uh, available environmental energy into routing uh, wireless signals in a more efficient way? I think there was a question. Ah, uh, oh, you're you're thinking of uh, you're thinking about hacking uh, an RF-powered uh, wireless system. Yeah, because well, Wi-Fi access points are always powered from the, from the mains, and uh, well, uh, if you're a, a, a sole uh, energy harvesting device, you you want having as much power beamed uh, along your part of your antenna. Um, uh, so, is, is there a way to actually uh, well just uh, fake that you are a device doing a lot of traffic, and well, you only want to receive lots of traffic? Uh, because well, you, you want to transmit as uh, well. You might might need to transmit a, a little bit of power to the access point, just to uh, ma make it send bogus packets to you. Uh, you could, but it will be very inefficient. Yeah. So the effort of doing that will be um, offset by the the extremely low efficiency of such a of such a setup. So there are actually modules available. I have them with me actually. A company called the Power Cost. Uh, is uh, building uh, base stations mm -hmm. that uh, transmit at uh, 433 megahertz in the ISM band uh, with uh, quite a bit output power, uh, 100 milliwatts, okay. uh, which is uh, the maximum allowed by uh, EU regulations. And then they sell these kind of modules with an uh, integrated antenna on them that immediately capture uh, this RF energy. Uh, what they don't tell you is that the efficiency is uh, uh, below 1%. Well, it, it would help if you're having an antenna size to the frequency that you want to receive. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so the larger you make the antenna, uh, the more power you can capture, of course. Uh, but uh, the, the energy density really depends on the environment you're in. Uh, so ideally, you could harvest in the 2.4 gigahertz band, for example, where Wi-Fi and ZigBee and Bluetooth Low Energy uh, and Sigfox and all these other protocols are operating in. 11. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, it, it really depends uh, on the environment. Yeah. Um, other questions? Yes, please. Another question? Here. Here. Hold on. Microphone coming up. Well, thank you for the speech. Uh, it was really nice. Uh, I just out of curiosity, uh, can you give us maybe uh, some numbers? How much energy you could harvest, let's say, for a, from a piezoelectric um, device? Let's say from walking. You know, you sometimes you hear about uh, trying to harvest the energy of walking. Yeah. You know? Um, it all depends on how much strain you want to put on the person producing this energy. So it's, it's really a trade-off. Uh, if you're looking at uh, the raw numbers, then the, the human body can produce uh, around 200 to 250 watts of mechanical energy. Of course, if you 
would hypothetically harvest all that energy that means you're not moving anymore because there is no mechanical energy left to move. Uh, so essentially what you want to is um, achieving some kind of compromise where you design a harvester that harvests a fraction of that mechanical energy without feeling like a burden to the user. Uh, what is being um, researched at the moment um, by Tom Krupenkin, uh, for example, uh, and other researchers, uh, are uh, energy harvesters embedded in the in the the, the, the shoes? Because you're any, every time you're walking, uh, you you create uh, a mechanical deformation of the shoe, and you could harvest energy from that. That is energy that is otherwise uh, just being wasted. Uh, there are other uh, applications in, in military body armor, for example, where they use uh, the movement of the knee uh, to use um, to to uh, apply energy harvesters for uh, cantilever-based uh, systems on. But you really feel that there is something blocking your natural movement, so that it's not so convenient. And also, you need then to put yeah all kind of straps around your legs to to physically mount this uh, on your body and. Um, if you have too many pizzas and it doesn't fit anymore. So there are a lot of constraints that don't make it very pleasant uh, to, to apply this. So what they're looking at, uh, PaveGen, for example, is another company that is doing this. Uh, they are uh, retrofitting um, um, a, a baseball fields in, in the uh, slums uh, around uh, Brazil, uh, where there are lots of young kids uh, playing uh, uh, soccer and, and baseball. Uh, in the middle of the night, so they now have equipped uh, these fields with uh, subterrain energy harvesters. If you run over it, then you create a, a physical deformation uh, that actually powers the lighting uh, around the field. Uh, so this already exists. Um, this is actually um, uh, uh, subsidized by uh, Elon Musk uh, as one of the, the leading technologies. So this is something that is not really visible as energy harvesting. It doesn't interfere with what people are doing. And I, I personally think that this is also the way to go. If you need to intrude in people's daily habits too strongly, then they will not adopt the energy harvesting topologies. But just, let's say, a normal average person putting piezoelectric generator and down under a the shoe. Piezoelectric energy harvesters are quite inefficient, so then we're talking about the order tens of microwatts to a few milliwatts. So just some LEDs, maybe we can just. Yes, yes, okay. basically, yes. Okay. Cool but shoes. Yeah, a few yeah. microwatts is already enough for a, a, a low-power microcontroller doing a wireless uh, transmission, for example. Okay. So it mm -hmm. really depends what you want to do in your application. Cool, yes. thanks. The, can you, the microphone get in the back, please? You said that solar panels also generate heat and residual energy. Could that residual heat be harvested in order to increase the efficiency of the solar panel? Uh, that's actually a very good question. Uh, so what is being uh, done now in research is actually combining um, solar panels with a, a black surface with um, thermal energy harvesters in the back. So if you basically glue them together, uh, then the front uh, harvests light. Uh, the panel heats up in the process. But by heating up, the efficiency of the solar panel actually decreases. So you ideally want to cool your solar panel. So instead of putting a heat sink on, well, you can just as well mount a thermal energy harvester on with a heat sink attached in the back and combine both. So that's one of these examples of complementary balance energy harvesting where you're harvesting from two sources simultaneously. Now, why it's not being used commercially yet is because the efficiency of uh, thermal harvesters um, uh, are a lot lower than from solar cells. So it's not really economically um, interesting to do this at this point in large-scale applications. But for energy harvesting in low-power wireless devices, this could be an interesting opportunity, yes. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, yep, please. Hi. In your monitoring device, uh, you have a MEM spectrometer or something like that. Yeah. And uh, you have also something to measure the um, thermal radiation spectra. Uh, we have uh, infrared uh, spectrometer, yes. Infrared, the mid infrared, or? Uh, the, the spectrometer ranges from 200 nanometers to 1,100 nanometers. Yeah, okay. So that's so covering no from infrared to UV. 
Yeah, okay. So no thermal radiation. Uh, no, 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 not directly. No. Okay. No. Just thanks. Are those uh, monitor devices available? Um, at the moment, they're actually these are actually the only ones in existence. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I'll have to disappoint you. No, they're uh, not commercially available yet. Um, these are research prototypes that are still in development. Uh, so I'm still uh, doing an effort to uh, get the price down. Uh, they're not completely finished yet either. So if any of you is uh, interested in, in collaborating, I am absolutely open to any kind of uh, ideas. Uh, the hardware is pretty finished by now, but there is still a lot of uh, embedded software development to be done. Um, writing a driver software for, for the sensor, for example, doing the data processing. So if anybody wants to help out in, in finishing them up, uh, then I would be delighted to, uh, to talk to you after uh, the presentation. Um, to give you an idea of the price, it's actually still quite expensive technology. So uh, as a prototype, we're talking about uh, 80 to 100 euros per module. So that's not something you could just uh, put on, on uh, yeah, any device because it's it's quite expensive. But I hope to bring them to market uh, once they are uh, mature enough. These are all open source uh, hardware and software, by the way. So both the, the, the circuits, uh, the calculations, uh, the software, it's all available on, on Circuit Maker, on GitHub. So if anybody would like to participate, you can. Uh, you can fork them already. Um, take a look at the circuitry. It's up to you. Anyone else? Or any more thoughts or uh, yes. ideas? One more. Yeah. Uh, yeah, about the uh, frequencies. Uh, where you what's the most efficient frequency to harvest? Because well, on the HF bands, there are less and less AM transmitters. AM transmitters output an awful lot of power. Uh, yeah, 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 that's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, so at the moment, uh, the most interesting bands uh, are the um, uh, GPRS bands uh, because they are still uh, being used quite a lot. Uh, for our cellular communication uh, and 2.4 gigahertz uh, ISM band, mm. uh, which are being used for uh, um, yeah, Wi-Fi, BLE, uh, Sigfox, uh, Zigbee, and, and many others. Sigfox is 868, I think. Uh, it's double frequency, I believe. Okay, quick, quick, quick. Oh. But yeah, to, to, to answer your question, it, it really depends on the environment. For example, um, in, in, in an outdoor environment, you will uh, have uh, GPRS coverage for sure, but yeah, somewhere in the middle of nowhere, you will not have any Wi-Fi networks, uh, obviously. So uh, it, it really depends on, on where you are, um, uh, which kind of environment you're in, indoor, outdoor, um, behind a concrete wall, uh, or, or just in a, in a wooden shed. It's, it's quite a complex uh, question, yeah. please. I have a question. Um, you're talking about 2.4 gigahertz uh, and uh, also the GSM bands, mm -hmm. GPRS. Uh, the power of FM radio and uh, TV transmitters is orders of magnitude higher. Uh, that is true, uh, but the problem is that uh, the Coverage is, is quite unevenly distributed. Yeah, okay. But uh, there, there is a subtle uh, other issue. Uh, in the early 1980s, when radio piracy was quite popular, people put out sometimes a truck load with a TL uh, tubes, like uh, we see here today in the tent. Uh, and then they uh, spontaneously started to illuminate because they were sapping the power from the ether. Uh, that was a trick for one of the pirate radios to get uh, silencing their competitors. Uh, uh, there is some re regulation and prohibition about uh, bringing uh, devices which uh, sap off uh, electromagnetic spectrum power too close to transmitters. Do you expect something to happen when you start to use it for mobile? Because there is a license holder who uh, put up the power in the air. Yeah, so that's what I uh, meant earlier. If you're harvesting, uh, if you're living next to a, a wireless base station and you're going to surround it with antennas to harvest power from, yeah, somebody is not going to be too happy uh, with you, of course. 
On the other hand, if you're uh, harvesting that power uh, on a very small scale, um, then, then that power is otherwise not being used anyways. Uh, for example, um, the um, 77 kilohertz band uh, that transmits uh, the um, uh, DCF77 uh, time signal across Europe uh, is a very low frequency band, uh, but contains a, a comparatively large uh, uh, amount of energy. So you could actively harvest from that, and nobody's going to really care about that. Uh, the problem is that everybody starts doing that on a large scale. Then, of course, the amount of power you need to put in these transmitters to reach everybody is, uh, is going to increase as well. Uh, and that is what I meant with one of my early slides. There is a difference between uh, energy harvesting in general and energy scavenging. So if you're harvesting from an otherwise unused source of energy, like solar power falling on your backpack, nobody is going to care about it. If you're going to tap into an otherwise usable um, sort of energy, then yeah, that's going to be resulting in conflicts. Yes. Final question? No? Can I have a final applause? For Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, that concludes the program for tonight, I believe. Uh, I'm not a herald, I'll just sort of, I'm an angel. I used to be, I, I'm normally a herald, but not for this talk. So okay, I just so applause in. for uh, the volunteer <laughs> who just stepped in. Thank you.